Constitution of the United States refers to the the uh, to habeas corpus, the, the, this very very simple and straightforward process that if you are arrested, you have the right to well, there's there's a whole series of of, of these rights that are articulated in the Bill of Rights, the Fifth Amendment. You have the right to to uh, to not speak in your own defense. Or, or to not speak against yourself if, if necessary, and to compel testimony. You have the under the under the uh, Sixth Amendment. You have the right to a fair trial, to be tried before a jury of your peers. Under the Seventh Amendment, um, you have a right to a trial by a jury. And under the Eighth Amendment, uh, no excessive bail can be, and no cruel or unusual punishments. Basically, all that in aggregate means that you can't be snatched off the streets and shipped off to some foreign country or to a jail here or someplace else without some due process. This was what the nobles were fighting against King John in 1215 when they forced him to sign the Magna Carta in, in the plain in Runnymede in articles, as I recall, 37 and 38, or maybe it's 38 and 39, basically lay out these rights. And then, then you had the British Revolution, and you had, or a series of them actually. Uh, five knights were were being busted in a tax case by the king, and and uh, that led to a, uh, one of the first British revolutions in the 1600s, and and all the way up to today. Now, carrying this forward, Barack Obama, before he was elected, on based on this 800-year history of of Western culture said to build a better freer world we first must behave in ways that reflect the decency and aspirations of the American people. He wrote this in Foreign Affairs magazine. He said this means ending the practice of shipping away prisoners in the dead of night to be tortured in far-off countries, of detaining thousands without charge or trial, of maintaining a network of secret prisons to jail people beyond the reach of the law. Brilliant. Exactly what you would expect from a constitutional scholar somebody who understands these principles. Well said. Scott Horton is with us. Scott is an attorney, contributing editor at Harper's Magazine. He writes the No Comment column at uh, Harper's website, harpers.org. Scott, welcome to the show. Hey, Tom. Great to be with you. Thank you. Where, where do we stand right now with extraordinary rendition under the Obama administration? Well, it may be that we've gotten rid of the word extraordinary, and we just have renditions. But uh, one thing is for sure, and that is that the practice of renditions has not stopped. Uh, in fact, I have a piece uh, uh, just out the uh, day before yesterday at Huffington Post in which I document in some detail uh, the first renditions case that's occurred on Barack Obama's watch. Uh, it occurred between the 7th and 9th of April uh, of this year when uh, a uh, Lebanese construction engineer was seized on the ground in Kabul, Afghanistan by uh, eight FBI agents. Uh, he was stripped naked, given a body cavity search, uh, shackled, uh, hooded, uh, had earphones put on. He was subjected to uh, uh, hypothermia treatment uh, and sleep deprivation and then put on a Gulfstream jet uh, sent off. He didn't know where. He thought he was going to Guantanamo to be disappeared. Uh, but it turned out he was going to Virginia, where when he landed, he was uh, charged with contract fraud. Contract fraud? We're talking about Raymond Azar, right? That's exactly right. His name is Raymond Azar. This wasn't even a case of terrorism? This was economic fraud? Uh, minor case, in fact. Uh, no allegations of terrorism, no terrorism issues surrounding him. Uh, he wasn't even a drug kingpin. In the past, renditions have been reserved for terrorists and drug kingpins. Uh, it's, uh, it was a petty contract fraud case um, yeah. in which the, the total amount of corrupt payments is about $100,000. You know, I want to make a joke about why don't they, uh, you know, why don't they be, uh, empl if they're going to employ these practices, I can give them a list of companies. <laughs> you know, they can go uh, well, after the CEOs, that, uh, right? <laughs> that's actually, that's a very good question. I mean, a lot of people who heard this said, like, they looked at the resources deployed. I mean, we have a dozen FBI agents sent around the world, a Gulfstream jet, uh, prosecutors, and so on, a massive sting operation. 
in a petty case, uh, the total amount of contracts is $13 million. The total amount of corrupt payments is $100,000. And yet we look at these massive cases involving, uh, uh, involving Halliburton and KBR and others where the Department of Justice just doesn't seem to have the resources to do investigations or do anything with them. Right. Uh, and this case was a sting operation in which we're dealing with a Lebanese construction company operating in Lebanon, uh, and the U.S. Uh, sets up a sting to see if they will pay a government contract officer a bribe to get a contract. Well, Tom, you know, this is the way business is done in the entire Middle East. Yeah, it's of course called they were going to do it. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> of course I, they were going to do it. In fact, you could have done this with any construction company anywhere uh, in the I, Middle I, East, and I, they would have done this. I know. I've, I've have been solicited for bribes in the Middle East and and other on, on two other continents as well, um, and and you're right. It is it is basically just the way business is done in large parts of the world, and and they don't think of it the way we do because they think of it the same way that we think of leaving a tip in a restaurant. That that, that's that's, a, that's yeah. how people you know people who who make very little money in government jobs, for example, in many of these countries, uh, uh, you know they. I, I remember I was trying to get into Uganda in 1980. We were going in to do to set up a relief program in that country during the war with Idi Amin when Amin was being thrown out. And I flew into Nairobi, and every day, you know, I was staying at this New Stanley Hotel. I'd go down to the to the Ugandan embassy and uh, to submit my visa application. And every day, the guy would go through this whole long thing for about an hour, and then he'd say, "Oh, I'm sorry, you know, we can't do it today. Come back tomorrow." And after three days of this, I was complaining about this to this, like, 60- or 70-year-old British guy who lived in the New Stanley Hotel where I was staying. And we would sit in the afternoon and, and you know, in the, this outdoor cafe and just talk. And, and he said, he's waiting for you to give him some money. You know, he's just waiting. So the next day I went back, and I, you know, I guess on the air I'm confessing to bribery here. But, you know, I slipped the guy a, a couple of bills, and boom, all of a sudden out comes the stamp, and there's my visa. And these guys, he didn't think that he was committing a crime. He thought that he was basically taking a tip, just like now in a restaurant in the United States, you, you leave a tip. And, uh, anyway, I'm not, to, not trying to defend this. What I'm, what I'm pointing out is that, is that uh, this is crazy. Well, the allocation of resources, that, in fact, uh, even people I talked with at the U.S. Embassy in uh, Kabul, who uh, had, some, uh, uh, had some advanced knowledge of the whole thing, uh, all said they thought the massive allocation of resources for this case just didn't make any sense. They so is this, is this Scott Horton with Harper's and with Huffington Post, is this, is this an aberration? I mean, is, uh, or, or are we starting down a new and, and terrible road here? Well, that's well, that's one thing. I think the the judge handling the case asked some questions that sort of suggested he was thinking, you know, is there adult supervision at the Department of Justice right now? Right. Uh, but I think it is showing a, the new kind of rendition, which is what we call rendition to justice. That is, we're not going to stick people on the black side anymore, where they're going to be tortured or turn them over to the Egyptians or uh, some other cooperating group of uh, uh, state security thugs who will torture them. Instead, we're going to bring them back to the United States and charge them with crimes. And I think most people view that, look, that's a positive. You know, we want mm -hmm. people brought into the justice system. The negative here is that uh, this process is still uh, has hanging over it allegations of torture, which are credible. Uh, right. and, and Mr. Azar uh, 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 describes all these things that were done to him uh, and says he was tortured. And the Department of Justice, in their response, rather amazingly, doesn't dispute almost anything he says. They said, well, that's all true, but calling that torture is hyperbole, they say. It's not torture. It's our standard operating procedure. Well, about half of it actually is in most American prisons. You know, the strip search, the body cavity search, all that kind of stuff. Uh, After you've been convicted and sent to prison, yes. Uh, but here, of course, we're dealing with someone, and they say that these procedures are necessary for purposes of safe transportation. Mm. Uh, but, of course, there are other things they can do other than the body cavity search. Well, one of the things they could have done if he's a Lebanese and he's in Lebanon and he's, and he's you know, committing a crime in Lebanon is they could have had the Lebanese government go after him. Yeah, or instead of inviting him to go to Afghanistan, they could have invited him to go to Washington, D.C., and arrested him there. Yeah. And that's a lot of people who've looked at it have said, this is one of the aspects of this case. It just doesn't make sense. They drag this guy all the way around the world to Afghanistan, and then they do these things, which are common procedures in Afghanistan, dealing yeah. with terrorists in particular. But if the guy had come to Alexandria, Virginia, which was the center of the sting where he was doing the contracts, and had the meetings there, there's no way they would have done any of these things to him. Yeah.
Yeah, so that makes you wonder why they set it up the way they did. Uh, but I think the big question the judge is going to deal with here is uh, the confession, because it, they extracted a confession from him using all this. He says he was told he was never going to see his family again. He thought he was going to be disappeared. Right. Uh, and uh, that, that's the big question for the judge. Is he going to allow this confession to stand? My bet is probably not. Well, I think it's marvelous, Scott, that you are exposing this stuff, because that's how it, an end gets put to it. And, uh, you know, good on you for doing it. It's uh, Scott Horton's new piece over at the Huffington Post, Target of Obama-era rendition alleges torture, and, of course, all his work over at uh, harpers.org and Harper's Magazine. Scott, keep up the good work. Thanks. Thanks for dropping by. 16 minutes past the hour, 866-987-THOM, our phone number, TomHartman.com, our free chat room. Drop in.